This is Linda. She's 54. She lives in Shoreditch in East London. Linda's husband, Dave, works for a local plumbing company. They've been married for 18 years. Linda is a keen follower of snooker and enjoys cooking for friends. She's also a member of the royal family. Abdicated in uh, 1936, all that shenanigans with Wallace Simpson, but um, that wasn't his first inappropriate affair. No, come to think of it, his first crack at abdication. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales shows again his keen interest in the welfare of the working classes in a visit to London's East End. takes time for a cup of tea with a local family. And turns a cuppa into an unscheduled stopover of an hour. Just shown in the back bedroom. New curtains and everything. When they just sort of uh, got undressed. I mean, it all happened quite naturally. She put a fresh sheet on and in they got. Didn't think nothing of it at the time. They wouldn't have unwittingly fallen in with the Tufnell family one of the most feared households of the old East End. <laughs> Billy Tufnell, known as Billy the Vicar, due to his skill in extracting confessions. <laughs> Blind Bobby Tufnell, his twin, left sightless after a boyhood accident involving a vat of eels. <laughs> and Rita Tufnell, their sister, <laughs> who kept house, cooked, darned, and specialised in high-caliber firearms. <laughs> And the Prince Regent seems most amused by his encounter with working life. Edward was indeed amused. Something in the charm of this ordinary East End woman had touched his heart. Something in the dark beauty of Rita Tufnell had begun to bridge the gap between royalty and organised crime. He was back the next day, weren't he? Of course, the neighbours were curious. They wanted to know why there was a coach and four out front. In the weeks that followed, Edward discovered that he and the Tufnells had much in common in the way of recreation. On shooting parties like this, they too would employ beaters to flush out the game. Then they would have their sport. A whole series of invitations followed during that summer. Rita went to Henley and Ascot. Edward enjoyed a mash and liquor jamboree in Margate. Soon, to the surprise of polite society, Rita Tufton had become his almost constant companion. Yes, well, the presence of that particular lady at official events uh, created uh, rather a problem. You see, because she was a commoner, uh, protocol dictated that she uh, couldn't sit at Edward's right unless she had a fresh salmon on her head. <laughs> that affair was not plainly serious. In August, Edward made an overt declaration of his intent. Dearest R, you have been on my mind ever since Sunday in South End. <laughs> the sweetest girl a boy could want. How do you feel about a bit of a bash at Westminster Abbey? <laughs> to celebrate the engagement, the couple took a trip to the continent. Even so, Rita had to disguise the nature of their relationship by travelling incognito. But soon there would be no need for such deception. Edward had sent a memo to the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, announcing his intention to marry Rita on their return. Baldwin sent the young prince an urgent communique, informing him on legal advice that it was constitutionally impossible to become king and marry a woman who drank sweet stout. She didn't want him to do it. She said, you don't want to go giving up all your dominions for an old scrubber like me. But he wouldn't listen. He said he'd already booked him a week in Chroma. <laughs> Immediately on their return, Edward recorded an astonishing abdication speech at Alexandra Palace. At long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. <laughs> I have never wanted to withhold anything from my people, but until now, it has been impossible for me to speak. Keep going, you take You see? With effect, at midnight tonight, I shan't be number two in line to the big seat anymore. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry about this. 
but I simply can't go on without the help and support of the woman I love. <laughs> the broadcast was due to go out at eight that evening. Edward and Rita were to throw a rag and bone soiree at the Dorchester to celebrate. <laughs> Baldwin was not finished yet. In he comes, waving this recording about. Eddie's gone and chucked in the towel, Jock, he says. Going to be a terrible mess. Now, you know a lot of nice gals, he says. Can't we shunt him onto someone else and save the monarchy? Well, I said, I'd like to help you, Stan, but the season's over. There's not a lot of well-bred skirt in town. <laughs> <laughs> Only one I can think of. American filly I picked up at the races. My hysteria... Name is Simpson. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. The carriage arrived, and she waved bye bye to the twins and got in. I don't know when she realised she weren't going to the Dorchester. It might have been when she started to feel seasick. <laughs> or it might have been when she heard the sound of castanets and this bloke in a bolero jacket offered her a glass of sherry. Edward. Finding Rita absent from the party was distraught. However, he was to receive unexpected comfort from a new acquaintance. Wallace Simpson had everything Rita did not. Money, vivacity, her own teeth. Before the night was over, they'd embarked upon an affair that was to leave Rita Tufnell long forgotten. She wasn't really bitter. She knew he'd been nobbled. And pretty soon she had something else to think about. She had me. 